Hi guys, in this lecture we'll discuss nuclear reactions and their applications. So let's talk about the difference between chemical reactions and nuclear reactions. Chemical reactions, you have one substance that is converted into another, but atoms never change their identity. So for example, a nitrogen atom will stay as nitrogen, but the compounds might differ. But in a nuclear reaction, atoms of one element typically are converted into atoms of another element. For example, carbon can become oxygen, oxygen can become nitrogen. So this is an example of a nuclear reaction, so where there is atomic change. So in a chemical reaction, electrons in the orbitals are involved as bonds break and form. So nuclear particles do not take part. So here only protons, neutrons and other nuclear particles are involved. Electrons in the outer orbitals take part less often. So and the reactions are accompanied by relatively small charges in energy, small changes in energy and to no measurable changes in the mass. But reactions here are accompanied by relatively large changes in energy and measurable changes in mass. So chemical reactions are generally influenced by temperature, concentration, catalyst and the compound in which the element occurs. Reaction rates generally depend on number of nuclei and but are not affected by all the factors that chemical reactions are generally affected by. Next, let's discuss the components of nucleus. Most of the mass of the atom is con concentrated in the dense tiny nucleus. So in comparison, if you consider uh, the mass, let's say if it's 10, uh, if you consider 100% is the total mass, about 99.99% .99 of the mass lies in the nucleus. Only about 0 0.0001 to 0.0001% of mass lies in the electrons. So most of the mass is must mostly in the nucleus. Nucleus comprises mainly of two particles, neutrons and protons. They combinedly are called nucleons. So the number of nucleons is basically the mass number. So a nuclide is a nucleus with a particular composition. So each isotope of an element has a different nuclide. So a particular nuclide is often designated by its mass number. For example, chlorine has two isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So these two are called nuclides. So a nucleus that has different composition of the nucleons. So we represent a nuclide by X, Z, A, where A represents the mass number, Z represents the charge. So Z in general represents the charge here, but most nuclei are generally written as charge. The main reason is because simpler nuclei, for example, electron is written as electron 0, negative 1, because its mass is nearly 0, but its charge is negative 1. For a proton, we write 1, 1, representing that proton has a mass of 1 and a charge of plus 1. A neutron is neutral, so it has a mass, but has no charge. So this is the difference between nuclides. So most of the nuclides are generally unstable and they spontaneously emit radiation. This process is called radioactive decay. So the intensity of radiation is generally not affected by temperature, pressure or any other physical and chemical conditions. So when a nuclide decays, it generally emits radiation and usually changes into a nuclide to form a different element. For example, they are in uh, nature there are three types of radioactive decay. Number one is alpha decay. Number two is beta decay. And number three is gamma decay. Alpha decay occurs due to alpha particles. Alpha particles are basically helium 2,4 nuclei. 
beta particles are generally two particles there are two different beta particles electron which is e minus one zero or a positron positron is basically a positive electron so electron one zero so these are the two beta particles that undergo decay gamma decay is high energy photons so they are not particles but they are photons in nature so basically gamma decay is radiation so that's the difference between alpha particles beta particles and gamma rays so alpha are helium nuclei beta particles are high speed electrons gamma rays are high energy photons remember the focus on the word high speed and high energy now how do you know the behavior of these particles so the simple experiment that is done is to keep between two capacitor plates and pass the rays through a radioactive material so in the radioactive material alpha particles always tend to move towards the negative side of the plate because alpha particles themselves are positively charged particles So alpha particles themselves are positively charged. They tend to move towards the negative charge of the plate. Beta particles are negatively charged. So they generally move towards the positive charge of the plate. And gamma particles are not influenced by charge. They are not influenced by charge. So to explain nuclear reactions, we write nuclear equations. So in decay, we, we form a daughter nuclei of lower energy from a parent nuclei. So parent here produces daughter nuclei. So the idea here is to make sure that the decay process is represented by a balanced nuclear equation. How do you balance the equation is the reactants atom mass number and the charge must be equal to the products mass number plus the charge so if that is carried out so this is where we conserve the total charge and the total mass so let's look at each decay and let's represent how it occurs so let's discuss alpha decay so we told that it's alpha particle so we can write it as alpha 2 4 or you can write it as helium 2 4 whichever you write it doesn't make a difference now a general decay equation will look somewhat like this if you take a nuclide az so it decays to form some element y where the charge becomes negative 2 and the mass number negative 4 plus it decays an alpha particle T4. So this is the skeleton equation for alpha decay. So this is the skeleton equation for alpha decay where the idea here is that the mass number decreases by 4 and the charge decreases by 2 so this is the difference between uh, alpha decay this is how an alpha decay occurs so z becomes z minus 2 and a becomes a minus 4 so remember this part of the equation now let's look at the next decay which is beta decay There are two forms of beta decay so let's discuss the first one which is electron emission so where the particle that comes out is an electron right. so let's discuss how the decay occurs so the general skeleton equation is x z a dissociates to form x z plus 1 a plus e minus 1 0 plus every electron releases an anti-neutrino an anti-neutrino 
is a massless and a chargeless particle so we do not need to write this every single time so we can skip this every time so, but just remember the skeleton equation that a beta decay occurs when you have so here what happens here the charge increases by one and the mass number doesn't change so z becomes z plus one and a becomes a so there is no change in the mass number so this is electron emission the second type is positron emission so what happens in positron emission you take an element x a is a so that dissociates so here positron emission releases a particle electron one zero so we do not write to write it an electron we can write a beta right beta zero one or beta positive for the other name for electron is beta negative now beta positive particle if it releases it becomes y z minus one a plus beta one zero plus it releases a neutrino again this is also a massless particle so you do not need to write this every single time but just remember the skeleton equation here the charge decreases by one and mass number does not Let's take an example of alpha decay. For example, let's say we have an element of radium. So let's consider the radium 88 to 26. Let's consider that if it undergoes alpha decay, then we know that 88 has to reduce by 2. So it becomes 88 minus 2. 226 has to reduce by 4. So it becomes 226 minus 4. And let's consider some ex some uh, element y plus so it releases a helium 24 now let's write down the element here so radium 88 226 becomes this element is 222 86 so if you look at the periodic table 86 is an element called radon so which is rn so this becomes the final equation this becomes the final equation for the decay. The next form of decay is the beta decay. So let's take an example of beta decay. So let's say a neutron with charge 0 and mass 1. If it undergoes beta decay, so where it releases an electron, negative 1, 0, so then the particle here it stays the same but zero becomes plus one so it becomes one we know that one one is a proton so this is a decay of a neutron so a neutron can decay into a proton plus a beta particle so this is an example of electron emission next let's discuss positron emission where uh, so an example of that would be a proton proton if it undergoes positron emission so one stays the same but this becomes negative one so it becomes here yeah, positive one so it becomes negative one so one becomes zero so one zero is a neutron plus uh, positron so here where the proton becomes a neutron plus a beta particle this is an example of positron emission this is an example of positron emission 
There are multiple examples. One another example would be if you take carbon 611, which is an unstable isotope of carbon, it undergoes beta decay, it produces a positron and creates boron. And the last one is, an, is a process called electron capture. So what happens in electron capture? So a proton can capture a high energy electron and produce a neutron. So a proton captures an electron and forms a neutron. This process is called electron capture. This process is called electron capture. So for example, uh, if you take an unstable isotope of uh, nitrogen 712, it can undergo electron capture and form carbon 612. So this is an example of electron capture. So this is also an example of electron capture. And the last one is gamma emission. Gamma emission involves the radiation of high energy alpha gamma protons. So gamma photons are released when other forms of radioactive decay. So here several gamma photons of different energies can be emitted from an excited nucleus as it returns to its ground state. So here the gamma emissions result in no change in either A or Z because they do not have any mass or charge. So a gamma particle is simply converting an excited nucleus into a stable nucleus or an unstable nucleus or excited nucleus into a stable nucleus. So this is an example of gamma emission. So let's try this problem where you have, let me do the first one, thorium-232 for alpha decay and you can try zirconium-86 that undergoes electron capture. So thorium is 232, 90. If it undergoes alpha decay, we know that alpha is a helium 24 nucleus. So what happens here? So it becomes negative 4 and this becomes negative 2. So 232 minus 4 is 228, 90 minus 2 is 88. So we know that 88 is radium. So this is the final reaction. So 232 thorium 90 undergoes alpha decay and forms radium 88 228 plus helium 24 so this is the alpha decay of thorium 232 so you have the problem zirconium as well so try this at home and see what you can do next how do you decide a particular nucleus is stable there are two main key factors that determine the stability of the nucleus. One is the number of neutrons and the number of protons and their ratio. And also the other factor is the total mass of the nuclide. So generally a plot of number of neutrons versus the number of protons for all stable nucleides is called as the band of stability that gradually curves for the line n equal to z. Lighter nuclides are generally stable when n equal to z. As the z increases, the n by z ratio for the stable nuclei also gradually increases. All nuclides with z greater than 83 are generally unstable. So let's look at the plot. So this is the plot of stability of nuclides. So this is the line that represents. So this line represents the n by z equal to 1. But as you notice, if you take an iron molecule where the n by z is stable, this is a stable isotope of iron, which is 1.15. So again, when you take a silver molecule which is a stable molecule of silver n by z is 1.28 as you go along you start noticing that there are more and more isotopes so if you take a small section of the molecules that you find under the radioactivity you notice the black blue so black here represents that those are stable isotopes blue represents that they undergo beta decay red represents they undergo alpha decay and green represents that they undergo either positron emission or electron capture. So this is an example of the stability of nuclides. Let's take a simple example of how, why the stability does this way. So we know that protons within the nucleus experience an electrostatic repulsive force. So we know that positive and positive do not like each other. So they try to repel each other. 
to overcome that force the force that's generally applied to keep them together is called as the strong force so it's also called the strong nuclear force so this force is the, is the one that exists between all nucleons that counteracts the weaker repulsive forces so remember that here the strong force is greater than the electrostatic force so nucleons are generally found in the nucleon energy levels and pairing of the spins like nucleons lead to greater stability so whenever you have even z number they have larger number of stable nuclides over half the nuclides have both even and even n and even z so even number of electron neutrons and even number of protons so if you take an even numbered proton it generally has more stable nuclides but an odd numbered nuclide generally has less number of nuclides that are stable so if you take both of them are even there are about 157 nuclides where z and n are even but if you take both odd that's only about four of them of all the stable nuclides that are formed let's take an example of each of these and see whether the stability matches or not so let's take a look at neon neon here the formula for calculating stability is to calculate n by z n is a minus z by z so a here is 18 minus z is 10 divided by 18 sorry divided by 10 so it becomes 0 0.8 so n by z ratio is 0 0.8 so we know that n is not equal to z first and n by z is much less than 1 so n by z here is much less than 1 so we know that it is really too low to be stable it is too, too low to be stable so that's why 18 neon is generally going to be radioactive but if you take so sulfur 32 here if you take n which is a minus z which is 16 and z which is 16 so we know that n is equal to z here so it means that they are most commonly more probably most likely to be stable next thorium so we know that z here is 90 so anything that greater than 83 is generally unstable and radioactive so we can say that this is also a radioactive material next let's take barium barium has n equal to 67 and z equal to 56 so n by z becomes 1.20 for z values between 55 and 60 so if you look at the bandwidth table if you look at 55 and 60 which is between 1.28 and 1.49 so the average is about 1.3 so must be greater than 1.3 so it has two free neutrons to be stable so here barium 56 123 is generally going to be radioactive so we decide this based on the table that we use so if you have a neutron rich molecule if you have a high n by z it generally undergoes beta decay so and tries to lower the n by z ratio if you have a proton rich molecule you generally result in low n by z ratio it undergoes positron emission or electron capture where it increases the n by z ratio we have heavy nuclides where z is greater than 83 they always undergo alpha decay and they try to reduce both the neutron number and also the proton number so let's see each of these molecules and let's try to predict what's the nature by which they act now let's take the first one which is boron so boron fight well so we know that first way to know this is to look at high n by z low n by z z greater than 83 high greater than high n by z represents electron emission low grade low n by z represents positron emission or electron capture z greater than n by 3 represents alpha decay so let's look at the ratio of n by z so n by z becomes a minus z by z so it becomes 12 minus 5 by 5 
so that's about 7 by 5 which is greater than 1 so we know that it's greater than 1 so it means that it has a high n by z ratio so which means it will undergo electron emission so it will undergo electron emission so we can consider that it undergoes beta minus decay next element is uranium so here 892 so we know that z greater than 83 so this undergoes alpha decay next let's look at arsenic 3381 so arsenic here is n by z is equal to a minus z by z becomes so remember that this is a and this is z so 81 minus 33 by 33 so which gives you so which is has a ratio of greater than one so we know that it also has a high n by z ratio so which means that it also undergoes electron decay next if you take the last element of lanthanum 12757 that has z equal to 57 and a is 127 so which is much lower than its atomic mass so we can use compare its at atomic mass as well so if the a value here is greater than the atomic mass then we can say that it goes beta decay if a value is less than the atomic mass for example here lanthanum has an atomic mass of 139 so 127 is much less than that so it undergoes either beta emission or sorry, positron emission or electron capture so this is an example of how uranium decays so uranium first undergoes alpha decay then undergoes multiple beta decays and then again undergoes alpha decay continuously so this has a series of so alpha and beta decays but the final destination is always the stable form of lead so it always tries to undergo the stable form of lead which is generally pb20682 so this is the final destination for every single element in the periodic table for every single radioactive element in the periodic table so it always tries to reach the stable form of lead 82